everyone, welcome to True Grace Church's online gathering. We are so excited that you're able to join us here this weekend. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for the technology that we have to be able to meet here together. Would you join us as we position our hearts and get ready for what God is going to speak to us today? Family, we're so glad that you're joining us today. We're going to bring him an offering of worship asking that you join us. Take a moment, just take a deep breath in, let a deep breath out, get your heart and your mind ready to worship the King of Kings. Light of the world, you step down. Here I am to worship 
Here we are to worship you. You are great and worthy to be praised. The splendor of the key.
are you, God? How great are you, God? Sing with me, how great are you? to you. There's nothing we desire more than for you, our King, to take joy in our offering of worship. We love you, Lord.
Father, we thank you that that's true. You are with us. And Lord, this is nothing new for you. You've, you've brought your people through famines, depressions, wars. And it can feel like a battle on the inside, Lord, but you've got it. You've got it. And so, Lord, we just take that big, deep breath and breathe in your peace. We breathe in your hope. We bring in your future. Because, Father, there will come a day when we get to walk forward again unheathered, tethered, and held back. And we want to be walking in your direction with your heart, with your hope, and be your hands to those that are stumbling and bumbling right, right now in the darkness. Because despite how it can feel to us, you are our light for our feet, for our path, for our future. And for all that, all we can say, Father, is a huge thank you, always and only, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Wanda, and this is my husband, John. Hi, thanks for joining us today. The really neat thing about online church is uh, that attendance has really gone up substantially, and we're able to reach a lot more people. And for every one viewer, it's probably one family, so it, the numbers are probably even higher than we know. Yes. Um, as you already know, because giving has been awesome for our church, and thank you so very much, we have three ways that you can um, send an offering to the church, and one is through the regular old mail, one is online through our website, and the other is bill pay through your bank. So whatever method you prefer, thank you so much for your continued giving. We appreciate it so very much. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we still have the opportunity to worship you uh, through our tithes and offerings and that uh, things can continue on even though they're different. Uh, we thank you for the faithfulness of this church body. We just pray that you would bless all the tithes and offerings as they come in and give us wisdom and how to use them best for your work. Thank you for all of your blessings on all of us. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. I um, grew up in church. I gave my life to Jesus when I was about five years old. And in middle school, at a youth summer camp, I felt God call me to be a pastor. And fast forward a few years later, and I met my amazing husband, and we got married right out of high school. And we quickly found out that we could not afford for both of us to be in school at the same time. And so I took a step back. And with the intention of going back as soon as he was done, um, but life happened, and I began to feel really lost in my relationship with Jesus. I had lost my purpose. I had lost the direction I was going. Uh, I honestly felt like I had missed my opportunity to actually serve God the way that he had called me to and that I had disappointed him. Well, at that time, God began to do a work in me and he challenged me and he said, Jessica, if you really believe that I love you, you don't just know it, but if you really believe that I love you and that you are saved by grace, then the things that you do for me don't matter. Your identity is not in the way that you serve me or the things that you do for me. Your identity is solely in the fact that you are a daughter of the King. Shortly after that realization, Pastor Peter did a message and talked about serving, and he said mature Christians don't wait to be asked. They look for the need and they start serving. And so, with no direction, I looked for the biggest need I could find, and that was in the toddler room at the time. And through that, God gave me so many more opportunities. I built some incredible friendships, and I actually got the opportunity to be on the administrative staff here at True Grace, which I absolutely love. And then God decided to say, okay, well, what about school? I was like, there's no way now. I have three young kids, I have a job, I have a husband. There's no way I can balance that plus the ministries I'm already serving in without something failing. And I was terrified. And God said, I, I'm asking you to do this. Will you trust that I'll be with you through it? I did it, I enrolled, I finished the last few classes I needed for my associates and immediately transferred into uh, the Northwest Partnership Program that True Grace had called the School of Leadership. And I'm really excited to say that God um, was so faithful during all that time and that I was able to finish my bachelor's in ministry leadership. I was still able to lead ministries. I was still able to have a great relationship with my husband. I didn't miss my kids' baseball games. I didn't uh, miss field trips. I still got to be present in what I was doing. It wasn't easy. 
uh, by any means. My husband and I joke that I really worked for my master's in time management because I had to plan out every single aspect of my day. Um, but God was faithful through it. And I am just so honored that he would choose to let me be a part of what he's doing. And I'm really excited to see what he does next. Hey everybody, welcome to Online Church this week. I am so glad you are here. Uh, listen, the sun is coming out and we are one week closer to live gatherings and reopening the campus. And uh, if you can't tell, I'm excited about those days. The fact of the matter is this, Pastor Dave is, is worried about it. I'm ready to open it, so we're good to go. No, I'm just kidding you on that. But <laughs> should I restart that? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> okay, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> You know, sometimes you think these things, you think, would that be funny or not? So, Dave, I love you, man. All right. All right. Here's the reality. We are one weekend. <laughs> you guys are making, I can't do it now. <laughs> and I want to let you in on the process because just this week, um, we've gotten real aggressive about walking through the what would have to happen and how does that have to happen. So we're talking a lot about kids ministry and, and would the kids all have to be in the weekend gatherings in order for that to happen and, and that's fine for like holiday services but if that went on for weeks or months what would that look like and, and then we're looking at the how many gatherings can we do everything that takes to do an online gathering and then also do you know live gatherings on top of that. Um, and how many live gatherings could we do? And how much can our worship team of volunteers really uh, pull together? How much could our, our kids workers do if we actually tried to have kids gatherings, you know, for the kids while the, the adults are gathering? And how many can we fit in the room? And, and how do we keep people safe? And, you know, what do you say to people when they come in the doors? And do you wear a mask? And all those questions. So there's a lot going on there. Um, but I'm just, I'm just getting excited that we're having some real uh, intense, aggressive conversations about what's it going to take uh, to make it happen. So if you're there with me, um, hopefully we're going to see some real progress coming up soon. Um, I love Jessica's story because she said that she saw a need and she just jumped in helping with the toddlers. And here's what's a, a biblical principle. I've seen it uh, play out in my entire life, and it's simply this. If you will be faithful in the little things, then God will give you greater things, Right? If you would just step up and see a need and meet it, um, no matter what it is, it just seems like it honors God when you just kind of jump in and just, hey, I don't know exactly where the best place is to serve, so I'm just going to start serving somewhere. And then God just kind of takes your life and kind of swims you in the right direction and you get to the right place. So uh, I love that. There's probably some of you right now that are going, I just need to jump in and do something. It doesn't even matter so much what it is. I'm just going to do something to help out. And I think God will honor uh, your faithfulness even in a little thing, all right? So if you weren't here last week, uh, we're um, part two, and we're talking about this question, not uh, what would Jesus do, but we're flipping that question around, and we're asking this question, what would Jesus undo? Like what, what in our world, our lives, our faith, um, would Jesus undo? What, what really grieves the heart of Jesus, and what would he change uh, in our lives? And it's an interesting question. Uh, last week we talked about spiritual indifference. How it's so easy for us to go, eh, and be apathetic and just kind of not really care. Probably should, probably shouldn't, but oh well. Um, Jesus would change that apathy, that indifference uh, inside you and me. Um, and, and we would go from uh, being maybe lukewarm about some of our faith um, and we would stop going through the motions. And we would live with passion and energy and excitement for, for what he's doing in our lives. So Jesus uh, would change, uh, would undo spiritual indifference in our lives. And so um, I was thinking about this week, uh, what would be the next thing that just really strike me as something that Jesus would undo? And so we're, this week we're going to talk about this. Jesus would undo hypocrisy in your life and in mine. Jesus would undo hypocrisy, claiming one thing, uh, but then living another way, right? It's the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did. And maybe you have a story in your life of a time that you were a hypocrite where you said one thing and did another. Um, we probably all have some stories like that. I have a favorite story I like to tell about that. I was talking to the pastor and he was telling me about a person in his church and, and she was a Jesus person and she was having a really bad day and I don't know what was going on. Maybe it was her health, maybe it was her finances, her job, you know, the traffic, but she just had enough that day. 
and uh, she was driving down the street and somebody uh, turned in front of her, didn't see her and cut her off. And it could happen to anybody, right? People make mistakes driving all the time. But she was so ticked off about it. She had just had enough and she drove up next to this other car. And man, she whipped out that middle finger and made sure that other driver knew how ticked off she was. And do you know what happened next? You might think, oh, she felt better about herself after she you know, flew the one finger salute. Um, but instead, she looked through her window and she made eye contact. And the person that had cut her off that she just uh, gave the bird was her lead pastor's wife. And they looked at each other. She realized what she did. She turned the other way. And I said, did she ever come back to church? And he said, we never saw her again. That's a true story. <laughs> um, hypocrisy. When we claim one thing, but then our behavior goes the opposite direction. Um, listen. For all of us, it's so easy to, to be like this. Hey, do as I say, not as I do. I remember hearing that going, what does that mean? It's easy to say, hey, this is what you should do, but it's entirely different to actually live a life that other people and young people can look up to and follow. So Jesus is going to speak today to us in the message about hypocrisy, the difference between what we say and how we actually live in our lives. Isn't it true, come on, we, we talk about this, that we're all hypocrites to some degree. There's some part of your life that doesn't match up with what you say you believe. And, and hopefully when you recognize those places of your life, that you stop and go, Lord, I'm humbled um, that I've got some areas in my life I need to work on, and I'm not claiming to have it all figured out or have it all together in my life. We're all hypocrites at some times in our life. We don't always live up to what our uh, our professed beliefs are. Okay, so we're going to start with a Greek word. So I'm going to go to the TV here uh, because I love this word. Um, it's pronounced hypocrites, uh, and it means uh, really close to our word hypocrite, right? And this is what the word means. Uh, it's a Greek word. And for those days, it meant an actor, a stage player, or one who hides behind a mask. An actor, uh, someone who pretends to be someone they're not. Um, one who hides behind a mask. In fact, the word actually has a mask connotation. So, you know, we were kind of looking for the picture with those masks. Uh, here's one of those pictures. Someone who maybe puts something on, it may look like you're smiling, it may look like you're angry, uh, but you don't really know because you see the mask, you don't see the real person. So, we're going to talk about this hypocrisy. Listen, Jesus doesn't want you and me to, pr to play a pretend role. Right? We're not like somehow like, oh, I'm playing the role of a Christian. Uh, the church is not uh, to put on a performance like we're following Jesus. Like he actually expects you to follow him and do what he says and follow his teachings and do what he does. Right? That's what we do as, as disciples of, of the Savior. What's fascinating is Jesus saved his harshest words for the believers, for the church, and sometimes for even the spiritual leaders of the church. He saved his harshest words for, for the church. Why? Because Jesus understood something that we forget so often. We sometimes expect unbelievers to act like believers in our world. I expect unbelievers to act like unbelievers. Because they don't share my values as a believer in Jesus, as a believer in the scripture, right? Uh, so be careful with that. Understand that. Um, but Jesus did expect those who professed faith in him to live out that faith in him. So Jesus had expectations on, his, uh, on the believers, often the religious leaders of the day. In Matthew chapter 15, he said this, You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you when he wrote this, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Listen, God wants your heart. He wants you. He wants the real you, not a pretend you, not an acting you, not a fake you, not a religious version of yourself. He just wants you. Um, not an image of yourself, not a show. God wants you, and he wants you to be real, and broken and authentic. And when you mess up, he wants you to pick yourself back up in his grace and his power. So here's point number one. Uh, it relates to this scripture. Point number one is this. Hypocrisy leads others astray. Hypocrisy leads others astray. Um, listen, if you claim to follow Jesus, then you represent Jesus in our world. And that's a really big deal. If Jesus is Lord of your life, then you won't be hiding that. You can't hide that from people around you. It's going to shine. He's going to shine out from, uh, from you. Um, God chose the church to lead the world. And yet sometimes we fail. Like I'll, I would turn on the TV and whether it's like a televangelist or whether it's a Christian represented on a sitcom, sometimes I cringe 
at the words I hear. And I will often think to myself, God, I hope that people, the millions of people that might be watching this show, I hope they know a, a true Christ follower. I hope they don't think that's what a, a real Jesus person uh, looks like. I hope they know someone like someone from true grace who's sincere and, and gracious and yet walks in the truth. Um, and sometimes that you know, sets us apart from the world. And, and if so, then that's probably good, right? I hope that um, people know a, a real Christ follower. Um, Brendan Manning said a famous quote. You probably have heard it somewhere in life. He said, the single, single greatest cause of atheism. Think about that. The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. Put the last part of his uh, quote on the screen. And he says, that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. How could people acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but then just go out and live the same way as everyone else? Um, and according to Brendan Manning, he thinks this is, this is the single greatest cause of atheism, that people that claim to know Jesus aren't any different than the world. And the world longs to see something more than what they have. Wow. The world needs legitimate examples of what it means to sincerely follow Jesus. Listen, some of you young people, you are in the vast minority on some of your school campuses. Like there is a, a, a small uh, percentage of sincere Jesus following teenagers on your campus, in your school. Man, if that's you, do you don't, don't, don't misunderstand. Don't limit uh, your effectiveness. Do you realize how important you are when you go to that school? As you look forward to the next school you're going to go to, do you realize what a role you play for the kingdom of God in your school? And don't downplay that. You're needed. Some of you, you are coworkers, and, and all your coworkers, all they have ever heard about is, is uh, the stories of priests and pastors making the news for all the wrong reasons. And you're the Jesus person that they actually know in life. And hopefully you're full, full of grace and truth like Jesus. And you represent Christ well to the world around you. Hypocrisy leads others astray. Uh, the Lord is asking you to lead others not astray but towards Him. To freely admit when your lifestyle or your attitude is hypocritical and then work on that rather than pretend. So I want to ask you to try this. Just say, Lord, I'm a hypocrite. Um, Lord, I just thought something. I just um, I professed one thing and I did another. Lord, I want to lead by example. Um, Lord, when I mess up, when I lose my temper... Uh, God, when I allow impure thoughts in my head or whatever it is, Lord, I, I, I want to just acknowledge that I need you. And listen, um, sometimes you're like me and you want to lead by example. You can really uh, get down on yourself when you blow it. If you can forgive others and if God can forgive you, then listen, you're going to have to also forgive yourself. Some of you are sitting on a couch or a chair right now and you're like, I don't forgive myself. You have to learn how to forgive yourself. If Jesus says he forgives you, then who are you to tell him that you're not forgiven? Forgive yourself in your life. I love in Psalm 51 when David is so repented over his sin of, of really adultery and uh, murder. And, and he comes to the Lord, and I love the scripture. I read Psalm 51 quite often, and I, I love this text because David says, the sacrifice you desire, Lord, is a broken spirit. Lord, what you really want is a contrite heart, a repentant heart, a brokenness, a softening, a, a conviction. And listen, if you have that conviction and that brokenness about your sin, you're not a hypocrite. You're the opposite. Right? You're, you're the person who knows you need a Savior. You're exactly what the world needs. You're a, you're a model of grace because you know what it feels like to break that covenant with God and to be separated from God because of your sin. Um, some of you, uh, you were let down by a spiritual leader, right? Because hypocrisy leads others astray. And maybe some in your life, maybe at a young age, uh, that you respected spiritually or claimed to know the Lord uh, let you down in a, in a major way. Um, maybe you've looked up to someone and it hurts. And, and honestly, it probably won't be the last time that someone that you respect lets you down. I mean, we're, we're humans. Um, 
The reality is this, we need flesh and blood humans because they inspire us. You need to be a flesh and, and blood human that inspires others in this world. But more than a pastor and more than a youth leader, more than anyone, look to Jesus in your life. Don't look to other humans and try to emulate them. Emulate the Savior himself uh, in your life. Um, instead of letting hypocrisy lead others astray, um, let's lead by example like Jesus does. And by the way, he's the only one that leads by example all the time. So we're following after him first. Here's point number two. Hypocrisy, uh, really, when it comes down to it, hypocrisy is spiritual pride. It's spiritual pride. I don't know about you, but I see the word pride and I go, yeah, people deal with that. <laughs> I'm just not, I just, I think of the word pride and I just don't go, that's me, right? But pride is insecurity. Pride is comparing yourself, uh, both in, in a, you know, better than somebody else or worse than someone else. Uh, there's a lot of forms of pride. Uh, selfishness really comes down to pride in our lives, right? So really, hypocrisy is spiritual pride. You know, Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he actually talks a lot about hypocrisy in that sermon. And it's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is teaching about giving to the needy, and he says this. He says, watch out. And when Jesus says, watch out, you almost wonder, like, what, is there a snake sliding up beside somebody on the mountainside? Like, what, what are we going to watch out for? Something's coming that you need to be alert about. And Jesus says, watch out. Here's what it is you need to be concerned about. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. He says, watch out. Be careful because you're gonna, this, something's going to come inside of you and you're going to want to be admired and liked by people around you. Come on, yes or no? And Jesus says, watch out um, for this desire to be admired by others for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. It's not just about giving. Watch out that you don't do things to please others, to impress others. And really what he says is if you do that, you've received your reward and it's over. That's all the reward you're going to get is other people looking at you and thinking you must be pretty cool. Verse 2, he says, when you give to someone in need, don't do it. I love this line. Don't do it as the hypocrites do. It can't be more clear than that. Don't do it as the hypocrites do. So when you're giving, give differently than the people who are hypocrites and are doing it for the wrong reasons, right? Here we go. Blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Yeah, you remember that very large check I wrote last year to the building fund, right? Jesus says, listen, don't blow trumpets in the synagogues. Don't stand out in the streets to, to call attention to, to your great gift. He says, I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they will ever get. Do you get the picture that Jesus is actually like, I can't wait to see the reward you have in heaven. I even want to reward you some here on the, on the planet, on earth. But if you decide to do all your giving in front of other people and make a scene of it, then that's all the reward you're going to get. But Jesus actually is looking forward to rewarding you and me. I think it's like, you know, if you were built a house for your kid and you were so excited for them to walk in and see that house, like Jesus is making like a place for you in heaven. Jesus has rewards for you and he's excited to give it to you. So he doesn't want you to get caught up in what other people think of you and doing things for the wrong reasons. He says, don't let your reward just be people impressed by you. There's so much more that I want to give you uh, in this life. Uh, verse 5, Jesus is teaching about not just uh, giving, but also prayer and fasting. And so he says this, when you pray, again, here we go, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Could you be any more clear, Jesus? Don't pray like hypocrites. Don't pray like people with masks on. Don't be an actor. Don't pretend. Don't use your special prayer voice. Don't try to look the part. Don't use long words, right? You don't have to impress people. Long prayers don't impress God. Sincere prayers do. Boom, mic drop right there, right? Okay, sincere prayers. So verse, uh, chap verse 5 says this, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. Don't pray like that. Don't pray to be seen. He says, I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Again, there's more reward, but you're self-sabotaging when you're trying to impress people around you and be esteemed or admired. Uh, than trying to please God with your life. You don't have to impress others. Let your life impress the Lord. Let your life impress the Lord. Here's point three. Hypocrisy dies when we invite Jesus to clean us up from the inside out. I love this because you can start cleaning up all the external things in your life. 
I'm going to stop smoking and I'm going to stop overeating and I'm going to stop checking out that jogger down the street and you're trying to figure all this out on your own. And the reality is this, hypocrisy dies not when we start working on the externals, but when we start letting Jesus come in, we invite him on the inside. Lord, change my heart. Uh, Form me. Spiritually reform me. Reformat my mind. I want to think and act in a way that honors you. Jesus had taught the people it wasn't about uh, foods and ceremonial laws that made them unclean. It was the condition of their hearts. And it is the same for you and I today. When people decide to live for Christ, God changes them on the inside. When you stepped across the line of faith, God began to change you on the inside. It's the condition of your heart. And true discipleship deals with the inner nature of the person. It's not just your external actions. Come on, how many of you know you can do all the right things on the outside, but people can still kind of, I don't know, there's something not right there. If you're just trying to look the part, if you're trying to get the right things done and impress people, no. Shape your character. Let the Lord come inside and heal you on the inside. Form your heart to be more like His. Shape your life uh, that you will think and say and do things that are more like Him. It may show up in your life when you invite the Lord to clean you on the inside out. It may show up in your life in ways that you might be uh, inspired by. You might have more joy in your countenance. You might sleep better. Uh, You might have... uh, better health. Your finances might be better. You're going to have a zeal for living. Your relationships will certainly be better if Jesus comes inside and cleans you up from the inside out and you got nothing to hide and nobody to impress. You're just real. You're just you. Don't underestimate the joy and the happiness that comes when you invite Jesus into your pain, your shame, your life, and He heals you from the inside out. It's a new way of living and it's a great way to live. But many of the religious leaders hadn't done that. They were still trying to look good on the outside. They were still trying to have the right you know, look to their robes, the right verses, the right beards, the right hoops and hurdles overcome. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, He says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, hypocrites, He calls them, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. So Jesus busts out the H word, right? And it's a word that uh, many thought should never be used when you speak of a religious leader. He actually says hypocrite. He looks at the religious leaders and he says, listen, you're actors and you're imposters. You're not real teachers of the law. You don't really know God, you're pretenders. I mean, there were, there were times when the, the, the disciples said, Jesus, do you realize how much you offended the religious rulers? And Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm so sorry I offended them. Jesus said, listen, I came to seek and save the lost. They need to know. It's more loving to tell them that they're off course. You're actors, you're imposters, you're cleaning the outside of the tomb. Listen, you can go to a, any tomb today, not just a, a, a tombstone, we're talking about a tomb And you could go and you could clean it up. You could wipe away the dirt, the moss, the debris. Uh, You could make it shine again. You could make it sparkle. But it doesn't change what's inside. And Jesus says, listen guys, the reality is this. It's still filled with death and decay and bones. No matter how good it looks on the outside. you got to go inside and let the Holy Spirit clean you from the inside out. Outwardly, Uh, Jesus says, outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are still filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. So how do you and I get past the external appearance, wanting people to like us, people to be impressed with us, and get to this place where we uh, actually care more about what's on the inside of us? We like to say that we're there, but I'm not sure in, in all honesty that we really are. Maybe you're like me and you've seen the social media posts, or maybe the dating websites. I don't see those, but I've heard about them, all right? And maybe you uh, have seen some of those. And I've seen some of these pictures, and, and the person really tries hard to make it look like they just rolled out of bed, you know, got their pajamas on and everything, but their hair and makeup is perfect. They got their little coffee cup next to their Bible. There's a little heart-shaped cream in their coffee cup, and their Bible's open, you know, like Proverbs 31 or whatever it is. And you just kind of look at this, and it's just a little too perfect. And you're thinking, how many filters were on that picture? Because sometimes we want to control what, how people perceive us. We want people to admire us or like us. And it's so easy for us to get it backwards. Listen, what if you cared far less about what your life looked like on the outside? Here's an even better question. What if you really cared about was your character? What if you really, what you really, really cared about in your life was your character? 
Like if you're like, you know, I, I want my parents to be nice. I want people to like me. But what I really want, deep down inside, is I want my heart to be transformed by Jesus. Whether people like me or not. What if what you really cared about in your life was your character? I'm going to close with um, the most famous scripture of all in um, Matthew chapter 7. Can you get the picture that Matthew had a lot to say about hypocrisy as he quoted Jesus? And of course, this one, probably if you're raised in church, you know it. And Jesus says, and Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Man, Jesus is using an overstatement, but he's making a statement, right? He says, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Let me say it as clearly as I know how. It's really, really, really easy to see hypocrisy in others. And let me say this. It's really, really, really difficult to see hypocrisy in yourself. Some of the things that we do that are hypocritical, we don't even notice. We judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our motives. And we don't realize sometimes the hypocrisy that's right there inside of you and me. So here's, here's point number four, and it's important. If you will work on you, you'll be able to help others. It's not your job to go around and fix everybody else. Really, we've got to start by working on ourselves. If you will work on you, you'll be able to help others. If you're going to help others, you're going to have to be growing yourself. And sometimes, you know, people come to faith and they're excited about taking, you know, 12 mission trips and speaking prophetic words into somebody's life and teaching a class and, and all those great things. But sometimes you just have to start and go, you know what I need to start with? I need to start with make sure I know how to pray. That I'm actually a person who's in the Bible. Some of you have been in church way too long to not be a person who's in the Word. And, and you need to be a person who says, Lord, search my heart, try me. Lord, I've been too much about myself. I want to be about others in my life today. If you'll work on you, you'll be able to help others. So here's the question. Do you see the hypocrisy in yourself? You can't control other people. There's only one person that you can actually control how they respond to God and how they live their life. And the only one person is you. You can impact others. You should impact your kids. If there's only one person you're going to say, God, the one person I can control is me. And so, Lord, if we're going to talk about hypocrisy this weekend, where am I sometimes a hypocrite? That I say one thing, that I believe one thing, I even teach one thing, but I don't live up to it. Lord, come on the inside of me and change my heart and form me and shape me from the inside out. I want to work on the external habits. I want to work on my heart that controls those habits. Lord, work in my life. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Lord, in living rooms, in homes, cars, even outdoors this weekend, God, Lord, we are seeking your face. And Lord, sometimes we don't measure up to what we say and profess we believe. And God, I pray, Lord, that the devil would not have shame and guilt in our lives. God, that we would so quickly confess. God, the devil wouldn't even get a chance to, to get any leverage on us. Because we acknowledge it. We know it. And Lord, we, we need your help. We need your forgiveness and your grace in our lives. Lord, some of us, we are hypocrites when it comes to money and giving. God, help us to not be that way. Help us to live for you. God, help us to not care what people think of us, but let us be very concerned about the character that you are shaping and forming inside of us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't need attention and, and acclaim, but God, that simply if you know that's enough. Lord, help us to be an example because so many people have a bad example when it comes to faith. 
or they don't have images of people who are sincere. So Lord, make this church, make us sincere as we follow after you. I love the story. I didn't plan to share it, but I love it, so I'm going to share it with you. In uh, biblical times, vendors sold pottery. And sometimes that pottery would get cracked as it formed or as it was used. And they would sell and resell pottery vendors on the streets, just there with all the fruits and vegetables, whatever they were selling, the fish. And so pottery would be sold and certain vendors put a sign over uh, their store that was different than the others. And the reason is, when they would have a cracked piece of pottery, many of the vendors would actually uh, form some dirt, some clay, and they would cover up over that crack. And so when they went to sell it, it looked perfect. And somebody would take it home and they'd put it in the window and the sun would rise and and that, that clay would begin to melt and they'd see the crack and they'd realize they bought something that had cracks in it. They bought something that had been filled in with wax and then repainted over. And it looked real, but it was an imposter. It was an actor. And so what happened is this. This is so incredible. That certain people who were actually honest dealers in pottery, they began to put a sign over their stand. And it said, Sin Seer. Sin. Without wax. Sincere. And it said, when you buy from us, what you see is what you get. It's sincere. It's without wax. You take it home, you put it in the window, you use it, you wash it. You're not going to find cracks. I pray that you and I, that our faith is sincere. That what you see is what you get. And if there's cracks, we acknowledge it. This one's broken. This one's got some work to do. This one's a work in progress. But we're honest and we're real. So, Lord, make us whole, make us real, make us sincere. And God, help us to be honest, loving people who love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, I want to remind you of this. Um, As we begin to um, kind of talk about different events in the summer and the fall, as things begin to open up, would you make sure you're checking out the website, make sure you're checking out uh, social media so you know everything that's happening here. And listen, thank you for your great attitude, for your patience, for your godliness uh, during this time. All right, God bless you.